welcome to Blackbriar Gaming. Today, we'll be looking at the seventh legion, the Imperial Fists, in the next video in our How to Build a Legion series. Hopefully, this is useful not only to those interested in the Imperial Fists, but for all legion players, giving them an understanding of the concepts behind army building in Horus Heresy, and an idea of what each legion can bring to the table. I hope you enjoy. A quick note before we get into it, a subscribe and a like really helps us reach a bigger audience. So if you enjoy the video, please hit those buttons down below. Also, be sure to check out our affiliate link in the description. The Imperial Fists, the Praetorians of Terror, the great yellow bulwark that holds firm as the traitors crash against it. The Seventh Legion offer a player so much flexibility in how they build their army and how they play. Potentially one of the most balanced legion, they can do both shooting and close combat fantastically, and have a wide scale access to deep strike, above and beyond what most other forces can pull off. So, super interesting legion, let's get into it. First up, the Age of Darkness box set. I'd argue that the box set is not necessarily an auto purchase for all Imperial Fist players, depending of course on how you want to build your army. Certainly, if you're keen on one of their rights of war, and you should be, because they're all fantastic, then the box set is an awkward purchase. The Mark VI tactical squads in the box won't play nicely with either of the Imperial Fist upgrade sets due to the way the torsos work and the arm options available. You're going to need to get snipping to disconnect Mark VI's butt plate, that's its official name, uh, from the rear torso bit and source some close combat weapon arms from somewhere. And if you're planning on 3D printing those arms, which is by far your best option, well, then you may as well print the whole Marine and get some Mark III armor styles in your life that I think kind of fit the 7th Legion aesthetic better anyway. Now, on top of this, Cataphracti Terminators don't get nearly the value out of the Imperial Fist's unique Storm Shields the Tartarus Terminators do. You're going from a 4 plus to a 3 plus uh, with Cataphracti as opposed to a 5 plus to a 3 plus with Tartarus. Now, it does cost them 5 more points, but you do the maths. Uh, and when considering the Spartan, a deep strike heavy army can probably leave this behemoth at home. You just don't really want to pay the points. And on top of that, the one unit in the Imperial Fist that really benefits from the transport can't take the Spartan as a dedicated one. However, if you're not planning on pursuing an Imperial Fist right of war, and you're looking at a more shooting focused army, the box set is absolutely fine. Your tactical squads get plus one to hit with their bolters, which is nothing to spit at, and you can use some of those Mark VI boys as heavy support squads, which get line from the 7th Legion's unique console. Cataphracti Terminators can still get Deep Strike outside of any right of war from a Imperial Fist upgrade, and a Spartan will always be useful in a balanced list. Now the Dreadnought will of course see use, right of war or not, always, it's just really good, um, even though the Praetors may possibly not. You see, the Imperial Fists have three absolutely fantastic special characters that I would always look at before a generic Praetor, with each one being suited to a particular right of war or army style. In summary, the Age of Darkness box set can be a bit of a miss for Imperial Fists, though the alternative can get very expensive, very quickly. So I'd probably still pick it up and get creative with my 3D printer. Now, let's look at the Imperial Fist's special rule and why it might just be a bit of a trap. Now, Discipline and Resolve, which when everyone saw they lost their minds, I thought it was the best thing ever. Here it is. It gives all Imper Imperial Fists a plus one to hit with any auto or bolt weapons during a shooting attack. And yes, this does include reactions. That's it, short and simple. What a novelty for heresy rules writing. Now this rule can be exploited by most units in the game. Tactical squads with bolters certainly go up in value. Heavy sports squads with auto cannons are a great choice. The multitude of Imperial Fist units, which including heavy sports squads, can get access to the Iliastus Assault Cannon from the Legion Armory, are now generally hitting on a two plus. Support squads are suddenly a thing and now looking very seriously at rotor cannons and recon squads with nemesis bolters just went from being top tier to being obnoxious. There are few legions that give any meaningful bonus to tanks, but the Imperial Fists, following their trend of flexibility and balance, make a number of armored units much more powerful with this special rule. The three big winners are the Sakaran with its Accelerator Auto Cannon, the Sakaran Punisher with its Punisher Rotary Cannon, and the Kratos 
with its Kratos Battle Cannon. So many cannons. But also, and here's why this special rule can be a bit of a trap, in the current heresy meta that we're seeing, well, a lot of these weapons kind of suck. A weapon that doesn't breach, rend, have strength 8 or AP 2 is going to have limited value on a battlefield filled with terminators and artificer armored units. Sure, your bolters are hitting on 2+, plus, but even if you're managing to pull off a Fury of the Legion with a full squad of 20 tactical marines within rapid fire range, which is super unlikely, I should add, you're only doing 4 wounds against a toughness 4 2 plus save unit, many of which have 2 wound miniatures. And that's if they don't shroud or have feel no pain. If you ask me, that's a whole lot of meh for a whole lot of work and a whole lot of points. However, auto cannons and nemesis bolters are hot fire with this special rule, and I'd include a unit with each in most armies I build. As an aside, certain units become less attractive due to this special rule. In particular, anything with ballistic skill 5 gets less out of this situation than units that can't quite shoot as well. Shooty Dreadnoughts and Seekers are two units in particular that you'd probably leave behind in Imperial Fist Army, as the premium points you're paying for their native ballistic skill of 5 is mostly wasted. Night fighting situations or flyers being the exception, of course. So, the special rule makes your shooting a bit better for certain weapons. Now let's have a look at their rights of war, which generally make your combat potential a lot better. There are three Imperial Fist rights of war. The Stone Gauntlet, Hammerfall Strike Force, and Templar Assault. There's a lot going on here with really interesting synergies between units and special characters, so let's start at the start with the Stone Gauntlet, and excuse me while I have a bit of a read. So, uh, Phalanx Water Squads can be taken as troop choices. They also get the Line subtype and Heart of the Legion special rule. Very nice, very, very nice. Uh, and that's a bit of a bit of a theme we're seeing here. It gives out lines when it makes things troops for the for the most part, uh, which is which is nice. A nice change after looking at something like the Dark Angels, for instance. Now, any models in the detachment, uh, here we go with a boarding shield, which is in unit coherency with at least two other models. So we're talking about you know base to base in in nice lines. May reroll all failed invulnerable saves made against shooting attacks or attacks made during the fight subphase. This bonus cannot be claimed if they ran, charged, or made a sweeping advance in the current player turn or are falling back. Rerolling invulnerable saves, madness. Absolute madness. So good. Uh, next, uh, boarding shields, coherency, two other models. If they charge, they gain the Hammer of Wrath, one special rule for the duration of any assault phase that they charge. All right, very good. Now, limitations. Uh, let's see. Phalanx Wardens have to fill compulsory troops choices. That's fine. They Nothing in the detachment can use Deep Strike Special Rule or otherwise uh, deploy as part of a Deep Strike Subterranean Assault or Flanking Assault. Very good. And a detachment using this right of war cannot take more elites or fast attack choices in total than they have troops in the detachment. Okay. So, Stone Gauntlet makes Phalanx Water Squads and Breacher Squads just absolutely hard as nails. We're talking some real old school base to base phalanx action here. It's really cool. Uh, this is a particularly defensive army where you'd generally rather be getting charged than doing the charging now that can char change without which certain characters we'll talk about soon. So the key to this right of war um, is to out shoot your opponent and make them want to come to you while also making to get in plenty of those spicy phalanx water squads and breacher squads. It does synergize therefore beautifully with the Imperial Fest special rule and the options available to them in the armory. So here's how we build it out. Now, first off, your HQ choices. Fafnir Ran is an absolute no-brainer here. He gives bonuses to all of your Breacher Squads and Phalanx Waters, giving them a weapon skill bonus on the charge. And weapon skill, look, weapon skill 5 is just so good in this game. It is Absolutely game-changing. It shifts assaults completely in the favor. Getting that extra pip of weapon skill, huge difference. Cannot state enough, that is the most important difference in an assault, having weapon skill 5 versus weapon skill 4. All right, so, uh, look, it gives you a lot more tactical flexibility than just sitting back and waiting. Uh, so Fafnir, auto-include, I think, in this right of war. He also has boarding shield, so he can take advantage of the right's rerolls to invulnerable saves, which is really nice. And he's an absolute beast in combat, both in tanking hits and putting out the pain. Because when tanking and just using one axe, his 
minusing the strength of the attack. So he's not, he's very rarely going to get doubled out uh, and instant killed. So uh, I think, I think he's just fantastic. What a model. He looks amazing uh, and he gives so much to the army. So Fafnir, he's going in. Next up, uh, I'd definitely be looking at the Imperial Fist's unique console, the Castellan, in a big 10-man heavy sports squad armed with auto cannons. These lads, uh, they now have line, so you can sit on your home objective while your phalanx steadily advances to put pressure on the midfield. If you got the points, another heavy sports squad, which still gets line, I might add, from that one Castellan, even though he's not in the unit, uh, with either Laz Cannons or Iliastus Assault Cannons, would be a great inclusion. Laz Cannons, look, they're the go-to in this edition, but I like to mix it up, and Auto Cannons have the flavor of the Imperial Fists, of course being an auto weapon, and hitting on those two pluses. Two units of Breaches and two units of Phalanx Waters is the absolute core of this army, and will give your opponent such a hard time. Put Apothecaries in this squads where you can, and create an absolutely unkillable block of infantry to hold objectives, and still put out some serious pain when you need to. Force your opponent to come to you with a decent unit or two of Recon Marines, armed with Nemesis Bolters, and you've got yourself a very decent army. A Contempted Dreadnought or two rounds this force out, ready to counter your opponent's dreads and deal with anything too tough for your Phalanx Waters to handle. Leviathan Dreadnoughts also do work in this army, where you're not too stressed about racing across the boards. I've seen mixed results with Leviathans because they're too slow, but when you're forcing your opponent to come to you, which this army kind of is, uh, then they can get some work done. Powerful stuff. Okay, so that is the Stone Gauntlet. Nothing too complex, but a really solid army that does absolutely amazing things with layers upon layers of special rule that synergize and build up with each other. Next up, for something completely different, the Hammer, Hammerfall Strike Force. Here we go. So, the effects, a little simpler than our, than our gauntlet. So, Phalanx Waters is still taken as troops, if you want, uh, but do not have line. All models in a unit composed entirely of models with infantry in this detachment can be given Deep Strike for 30 points per unit. This is nuts. I don't think this exists anywhere else in Heresy, just to give every single infantry unit Deep Strike so good. And just as added salt to that, uh, look, when they're upgraded to have the strike rule, um, blah, 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 they game shrouded 5 plus when deployed onto the battlefield as part of a deep strike assault. And then it lasts until the beginning of the controlling player's next turn. So good, so good. So they don't only get it on the turn they deep strike for any incoming fire they might face, but if for some reason they don't get into assault, they've still got it, the shrouded 5 plus, in your opponent's turn. Delicious. Uh, limitations. Models with vehicle unit type uh, must go into reserve and cannot be assigned to deep strike, subterranean assault, or outflanking assault, and you cannot take any fortifications. So, as I said, while Phalanx Waters can still be taken as troops, they don't gain line in this right of war, so I'm not as excited by them in this army, even though they are still fantastic. So, you probably want to include a unit of them, because why not? But they're going to fulfill a very different role, and you're not going to take probably more than one. Now, mainly uh, because you can, you want, or <laughs> because you want to, uh, give them Deep Strike. So, you're going to be giving those Phalanx Waters Deep Strike, it's going to be really cool. If you're taking this right of war, you're going hard in on that Deep Strike Assault, because why wouldn't you? Uh, it's just so good. Deep Strike, amazing. You can assault out of it, people. Do it. So, let's start with HQs. I'm leaving Fafnir around at home this time, and I'm going to take Alexis Pollux in this right of war. He has Deep Strike natively, so you don't have to pay for it. Uh, in fact, remember that any independent characters you take in this army, uh, and really in any Imperial Fist army, unless a right of war says otherwise, you can give them the 20 point teleport strike upgrade from the Imperial Fist armory and save yourself some points. So instead of 30, you pay in 20. Uh, Pollux is great because he not only gives his own squad Deep Strike, which saves you either you know 25 points for Terminators or 30 points for any other infantry from the right of war, but because he can redeploy a unit that you have holding the table until the rest of your force arrives. And hopefully, this then hides it from the enemy units that have a good line of fire to it. So let's say you put down a heavy sport squad uh, that is starting on the table because you don't want to Deep Strike them because why would you? But... As you set them up, your opponent then counters and puts a, you know, a unit of recon marines or something else facing off against them, and you just don't want to have to deal with that. So Pulix lets you redeploy that unit. So good for deep striking, because it makes sure things on your table aren't dying until your deep striking force can arrive. Now, another beat stick character, beat stick character, there we go. Perhaps a Legion Chaplain uh, is a great option to accompany one of your other deep striking units to push their combat potential over the edge. 
a Legion champion here might be good to offset some of the weaknesses of some of the units that might be deep striking. Let's say you're deep striking some Templars and you wanna get some AP2 in there. Um, look, plenty of options, but you can't go wrong with a Legion chaplain and for 20 points, your character now deep strikes. There are so many squads that gain so much from Deep Strike besides that, Unix of Phalan that unit of Phalanx Waters we mentioned before, uh, Command Squads, Terminators, Veterans, Tactical Support Squads even, uh, big units of Despoilers, because they're so cheap. These all make for great Deep Striking options. Templar Brethren with Deep Strike also seems good and, and characterful. We're Imperial Fist, let's get the special units in there. Uh, so we'll get them in a the list too. Give these a weapon skill five zealots melter bombs to handle enemy dreads and you are absolutely laughing. That's right people, a Templar brethren, melter bombs every time. Chuck them in, give them to them, they're great. Now you're leaving the vehicles at home in this right of war, so having some recon marines, tactical squads or heavy sports squads holding your side of the table until your deep strike assault arrives is very important. If everything dies and you're not on the table, you're in a bit of trouble. Nothing fancy, it just has to survive a few turns. All right, so that is the Hammerfall Strike. Super good, deep striking everything is just amazingly powerful. I think as the months go on, we will see more and more very assault-based Imperial Fist armies because it's outrageous. I don't think people have quite caught on yet. But lastly, we'll look at the last uh, right of war. It has just as much spice as the first two. We're talking about the Templar Assault. So what are the effects? Units of Templar Brethren can maybe be taken as troops and they get the Heart of the Legion special rule and the unit, the line unit subtype. Once again, those special units getting line is just, it's so good and it's not everywhere. So for the duration of any turn in which a unit of Templar Brethren taken as part of this detachment using this right of war, disembark from a model, all models in the disembarking unit gain the Rage 2 special rule. Now, very interesting. The way this is written actually implies that, say, attached apothecaries or special characters also get Rage 2 when they uh, when they disembark and then charge. But uh, but who can say? Who can say how that works exactly? It's a bit, it's a bit ambiguous. Uh, but either way, Templars coming out of transports, getting an extra attack on the charge there. Very nice. Um, Limitations, um, yeah, compulsory troops must be filled by the Templars, that's fine, has to be loyalists, of course, and you cannot, once again, take more elite or forced attack, fast attack, then you are taking troops. No issues there, limitations are very minimal for this one. So, Templar Brethren are a lot of fun, uh, but those combat shields aren't going to stand up to anything powerful that manages to hit them back. Furthermore, Strength 5 Power Swords are nice, but will generally fall flat against enemy 2 plus save 2 wound units. So these boys are going to need some help. But first, let's start with the HQ and the core of the army. So the only choice for leading this force is, of course, Sigismund. What a beast. He's got Eternal Warrior, which you see so rarely in this edition, and it makes this Crusading Psychopath very survivable. His black sword is outrageous with plus two strength, AP two and instant death, all wrapped into a package striking at initiative five. He is just, he's so good. He's got a bunch of other rules going on. No other non Primark character competes with him in a straight up duel, just doesn't happen. And look, he did it in the law and he might do it on a table. He'll have a go at a Primark, cause why not? With instant death doing D3 wounds, he can just, he can do some serious, actually, I don't know if that's true against Primark. Probably not, I imagine not, but either way, He's going to have a crack, hey? Eh? So we've got Sigismund. Uh, we're going to put him in it. It'll take out Dreadnoughts. Oh, geez, he'll give Dreadnoughts a hard time. So we're going to put Sigismund in a unit of Templar Brethren, because of course we are. And we're then going to shove them into a Land Raider Proteus, because we want that rage action. And we're going to just, we're just going to throw them up the table. There's some tactics for you. Now, to accompany them, I want two more units of Templar Brethren, and I want them in Land Raiders as well. Three just feels right. Now, this isn't cheap. If we're going with 10 strong units of Templars, we're already at around the 1850 mark, Sigismund included. But geez, it feels good. It feels so good. So look, let's look at other units that are really going to boost this force, depending of course on the point level that you're playing. So we've got three Land Raiders on the table. So let's go with some more vehicles to diminish the effectiveness of a lot of our opponent's firepower that's coming this way. So as I mentioned before, two of the Sakaran variants benefit nicely from the Imperial Fist special rule. A regular old Sakaran and a Sakaran Punisher make great additions to this army. 
But also a couple of, you know, one or two whirlwind Scorpius are also fantastic for targeting any enemy units wherever they are that might be giving your tanks trouble as they roll up the table. If more tanks aren't appealing to you, a unit of Tartarus Terminators with the Teleport Strike upgrade that lets them deep strike, and armed with Thunder Hammers and Vigil Storm Shields, the Vigil Storm Shields being that special Imperial Fist shield that you can get with that 3 plus and vulnerable spicy save, these guys really offset the weaknesses of Templars. Um, the, the Strength 8 being the main one there from the Thunder Hammers, and same, same, they're out survivability from a 3 plus invulnerable saves. If you're looking to go all in on assault with this army, which is definitely not the wrong answer, uh, these guys are a solid choice and just a really great addition to any Imperial Fist army. Lastly, because I recommend it in every single Imperial Fist I talk about, a unit of Recon Marines with Nemesis Bolters to sit on the backfield objective is good. Take one, I'd say take two, but you probably won't have the points in this list. If there happen to be any points left, contempt to Dreadnoughts. Always contempt to Dreadnoughts. And that's the three rights of war. I don't think I need to go deep into their armory or characters as they've already been integral to our discussion about the rights of war. They have a bunch of great characters, a bunch of great stuff in the armory. We've already talked about it. It fits in the list beautifully, but let's, before we, uh, before we say farewell, let's have a look at what a 2000 point list looks like for a stone gauntlet Imperial Fist army. I like 2000 points as it forces you to make some considered list building decisions. And I've chosen stone gauntlet as it is, as it is just quintessential 7th Legion. I also believe it's actually the more consistent and competitive approach in the current Heresy meta. Um, you know, Hammerfall, <laughs> Strike can just, it can go real well, but look, if, uh, if an enemy Master of Legion happens to be hiding behind a wall on the other side of that table, it can also go really sadly. So, we're gonna look at Stone Gauntlet. I think that's how I'd wanna play Imperial Fist. I think that's pretty popular. Let's get into it. So in the HQ slot, as I discussed when discussing the Rite of War, we're looking at Fafnir Ran. He is an auto-include. He is in this list every single time. And I'm backing him up with a Castellan armed with a Mastercrafted auto cannon. He gets three shots out of that thing, which is just, it's cute. And for only 85 points, making those heavy support squad line is just, it's really nice. So moving into elite, uh, elites, I've got a Legion Contempt of Dreadnought in here. I really like the Power Fist with Melter Gun and Gravis Melter Cannon combo. I think it's really good. I think it offsets some of the things that list list is going to struggle with, which is blowing up vehicles and, uh, and putting wounds onto enemy Dreadnoughts. I managed to fit a couple of apothecaries into this list. I'd love to fit in four, but the points weren't quite there. You could look, you could cut a few things, uh, specifically, you know, some Nuncio Voxes and some, some Augury Scanners and maybe a Marine here or there, and you could get the four apothecaries. I like neatness in a list, so I've just gone with two, and I'd put them into the Phalanx Water Squads I'm about to talk about. Uh, but before we get then, Breacher Squads. Two Breacher Squads of 10. I'd love these to go to 15, but I'd rather spend the points elsewhere. So 10 strong Legion Breacher squads walking up the table with Nuncio Voxes, Sergeants with Artificer Armor, and three Graviton guns each. Grav guns, people, Grav guns are so good. They're so good. Yes, they're a little tricky to use when you're not relentless, but you can make it work. And certainly if this unit's getting charged uh, by a Dreadnought and you shove them in front of a Dreadnought and dare them to come at you, you're gonna do some, you're gonna do some pain. You're gonna do some pain on that thing. So we've got the two Legion Breacher squads, both at 10 men each. We then have two Phalanx Water squads, identical. 10 Marines, they come with, I, I like to run them, with a Nuncio Vox, a Legion Vexilla, because you want these guys in combat, of course. Two Thunder Hammers, this offsets the, the inherent weakness of Power Axes, which is that low strength. Thunder Hammers, so good. The option to take them in a unit, so good. Uh, your Water Sergeant, give that guy Artificer Armor because these guys do only have a three plus save. And arming him with a Solarite Power Gauntlet, which is that souped up Imperial Fist Power Fist is just so spicy. You've now got three weapons in this squad, which can put out some really high instant killing if needed pain. And by instant killing, I of course mean doubling out the toughness of your general Marine. So these squads come at 300 points each. They're not cheap, but geez, they're survivable. Rerollable three plus invulnerable saves. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. That's when they're, they're all hanging out, hanging out together, touching. Uh, lastly, in the troop section, and this is four line units here. So I really like that. I love line. I look to pack as much line into a list as I can these days. So to round it out, Legion Reconnaissance Squad, just six of them, they're pretty expensive with six Nemesis Bolters and an Augury Scanner. An Augury Scanner is a must take in this unit. Do it, always do it, just in, not, in fact, yeah, just in case night fighting comes along. 
Lastly, to round out the list, a Legion Heavy Support Squad, 10 Strong, Auto Cannons, Augury Scanner, and a Sergeant with Artificer Armor. The Castellan will hang out with this unit, uh, whereas Fafnir will hang out with one of the Phalanx Water Squads. Or if, you know, maybe he goes with a Breacher Squad. Maybe the Phalanx Waters can take care of themselves. And, uh, and you turn one of those Breacher Squads into more of a combat-orientated squad by shoving Fafnir in there. Look, I'd probably put him in the Phalanx, but whatever floats your boat. So that's the uh, that's the list. That's the Imperial list that I would want to run and that I would build towards for my first army. I think it, it comes out right at 60 Marines in total, which is which is really neat, including the uh, the characters and the apothe- apothecary uh, apothecaries. There we go. Uh, so 60, 60 Marines and a Dreadnought. Neat. Nice and neat. Can't go wrong. But I think that about does it for the Imperial Fists. Uh, the Stone Cold Defenders of Terra can be both unmovable pillars of ceramite and a deep striking storm of death they're so flexible and with so many great ways to run them i think they'll develop as a favorite amongst the loyalist legions i think their characters in particular make them a really interesting and powerful force backed up by some great rights of war and tasty legion specific units if there's anything you think i've missed or anything you'd change in my army list definitely leave a comment let me know but importantly make sure to keep rolling those dice and getting hyped for heresy.